Linear Regression, Data Management, MDM4U. Now this material uh, pertains to the first two sections of Chapter 3. So I expect you, just like you did in Chapter 2, to consult the applicable text. Uh, it didn't look like that was made clear to all the students, but uh, it should be made clear that uh, just because you're getting a lot of material from me online, it doesn't mean you're abandoning your textbook. That textbook is still pretty central. What is a correlation? So, okay, well, what is a correlation? Correlations are the notion that two particular variables are related. For example, the more time you spend running on a treadmill, the more calories you'll burn. Or the taller people have larger shoe sizes and shorter people have smaller shoe sizes. Now, it could be quite true that maybe you might run into somebody who has who is tall that has small feet it could be quite possible not outside the realm of possibility and um, but that's due to individual variation but you'll notice overall more or less that there is a strong regularity a strong correlation between things like shoe sizes and how tall you are the longer your hair grows the more shampoo you need and so on um, what about, uh, now these were, these were examples of positive correlation. There are of course examples of negative correlation. That means that the, the bigger one of the variables gets, the smaller the other variable gets. So the more absences a student has, the lower their grade. Or if a train increases speed, the length of time to get to the final point decreases. If a chicken increases in eggs they, in age, the amount of eggs it produces decreases. So you notice one variable goes up, the other variable goes down. Okay, so now correlations uh, are not just positive or negative. They can also be strong, moderate, or weak. As given in this uh, scale here on the bottom, uh, it's kind of a kind of a cool scale. Um, and I wish this thing down the bottom would go away. But you have a, a, di a distinction between a negative linear correlation and a positive linear correlation. And you can have strong, moderate, and weak in both counts. You know, you can have weak, positive, weak, negative, and so on. Now, zero just means no correlation. A one means perfectly positive, and the negative one means perfectly negative. In between, the number line is divided into thirds. So you have zero to one third being weak, one third to two thirds being moderate, and two thirds to one being strong. And the same is true going in the opposite direction. Um, I came across some material uh, earlier today that I thought I'd kind of reuse. And uh, this is actually stats, statistics taken by Statistics Canada. And this is uh, comparing uh, the Aboriginal population versus the non-Aboriginal population. We're comparing Aboriginal versus non-Aboriginal population. And uh, now Aboriginal, people of Aboriginal identity tend to be First Nations, Métis, or Inuit. And non-Aboriginal is pretty much anyone else. These statistics are taken by Statistics Canada. And um, we have here... A bunch of numbers regarding weekly wages. So you're being asked to plot two different scatter plots, one for Aboriginal and one for non-Aboriginal. This example I'm saving for um, a spreadsheet type of problem. Uh, if I were teaching you in a, a regular uh, course uh, with a, a live classroom, and you know I was teaching you like in class. Um, this would be a very different sort of course, and uh, you guys would be learning how to do this by hand on paper. Um, however, it's not like that in, uh, in when we're online. So because we're online, you're going to be doing a lot of your stuff um, using spreadsheets and, of course, using formulas. However, that does not preclude, you know, how would you do it by hand, you know, sort of thing, and just answering those questions along the way. So these numbers that you see here are just data that's simply gathered by Statistics Canada. These are numbers that would have been researched, and here are the years that they occurred in. So um, basically, you make a table, then you make a scatter plot. So 
really if we go back if we go back to the previous table really all we need to do now is make a scatter plot the year would be the x-axis and the wages for aboriginals would be on the y-axis but of course the wages for non-aboriginals would also be on the y-axis you can actually have two sets of points on the same set of axes in google sheets you make a table by pasting or typing the data on the last slide into google sheets so if you want to try this yourself you can um, now, of course, the, maybe a better way to do it if you're if you're not too confident about pasting, you can always just um, type in the data. It's only like ten, I think it's ten sets of data, and uh, then select the entire table. Uh, you paste it on the spreadsheet, and then go to the menu and click Insert, and then Chart. Right? You you actually you actually select the entire table. That means all three columns, including the even the labels. Even select those, the labels too, year, Aboriginal population, and non-Aboriginal population, including all of the data below it. So select all of that, and then go to Insert, and then Chart on on the um, up in the menus above the editing area. Normally, this should result in the right thing coming out. Normally, it does know what to do, and it does give you a good scatter plot. Now, if it doesn't, just delete the chart and just try it again. Try it all the way back from selecting your data. So you should get a table like this. And you should get data like this. Basically, your chart should have two sets of data. And notice that you, you can kind of tell right off the bat, non-Aboriginal population appears to be earning more in wages on any given year than the Aboriginal population. The thing is, as you know, as you can see here, all of the points are high on the graph. Notice there's a lot of empty space down here, down below in this area. So we can actually fill out the graph a little more, uh, like this, by scaling the graph on the y-axis and just choosing the limitations. On, on this side, on this panel here, you're being told how to do this in Google Sheets. Okay, so I'm just going to move over that. You can read that on yourself. So questions to ask yourself for this data. In any event, is it, diffi it, it is difficult not to notice that you know, non-Aboriginals are earning more than Aboriginals. Um, a good question would be to ask, what is the average percent difference in any given year? That might be a good question, but that's not really a linear regression question. Um, because that wouldn't be related to year. That would be related to how much more does one group of people get paid over another group. So in terms of linear regression, we can also ask, and this is something that would be more pertinent to linear regression, has wages increased overall with time? One kind of gets a sense by looking at the data that that's true. And of course, we would like to know how strong the correlation of wages versus time actually is. Um, but, but for this, we need to discuss linear regression. So we're going to move away from this example for a while. We're going to return on the last one or two slides of this presentation to the Aboriginal example. So we have this line of fit or least squares line. And, um, you know, you basically all, all data that's kind of scattered about like this like this Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal populations. You can imagine just sort of drawing the best line you could with a ruler, going through the data. And certainly it would not look like this red line that you see on this slide. The red line here that you see on this slide is really n not being uh, close to very much of the data. And as you can see, the vertical distance from the points as indicated by the vertical lines is very long for some of the points and that adds up um, so you know like for ex now those by the way those vertical lines which signify the distance between the regression line and the point is called a residual so we want to actually if you added up the squares of all these residuals together you know the reason we square them is because some residuals are above the line some are below the line so some end up being positive and others end up being negative if we square all those numbers and add them together, what kind of a line would give us the lowest possible sum of squares? And this is how we come about the idea of the least squares line. Okay, 
uh, which is synonymous with the line of best fit. Basically, we want those residuals to be, on average, as small as possible. In other words, it's kind of like these points sort of jockey amongst themselves to get the best line it can that satisfies, that, that produces the shortest distances between the point and the line. The line that you see here isn't a very good line. Uh, this is uh, done on a GeoGebra app, which is actually linked to this uh, lesson today. Uh, not to the slideshow, but to the lesson, so you'd have to go back to Google Classroom. And um, you can manipulate that red line by actually tweaking these two dots over here, this dot over here, and this dot over here. And um, so, but as you can see, there's clearly a linear trend of those blue points. The blue points are the data points. And you can see clearly there is a definite trend. It's just that for badness, I just made this line do something really stupid and made these residuals as high as possible. It turns out that in blue here, it says target SSE. That's the sum of the squares of the residuals. And it says 1.04668 or 688. And that tells me that it already knows what the line should be. So it's really being coy. It's asking me to guess what the line should be. And of course, my guess, which was deliberately wrong, was 124.9651 in terms of the least squares, the, the sum of the least squares. Well, this is, you know, this couldn't be uh, more off the mark, uh, you know, uh, than anything else. So basically, the target least squares is what we're going after. So we got a long way to go from 124.96 all the way down to 1.04. But hey, this is not this is possible to do. You can definitely see that there's a strong correlation going on here. So it kind of this one's kind of easy to work with. So um, I call them residuals, these vertical uh, vertical points, but uh, I'm not the only one who calls them residuals. Your textbook also refers to them as residuals. Um, and we want the sum of the squares of those residuals, the length, the distance, the vertical distance between the point and the line, the vertical distance to be as low as possible, right? The sum of the squares of the vertical distances to be as low as possible. Okay, so that's that's kind of what we're going for here. And the example you see here obviously has to be manipulated. And uh, the as you can see here, uh, I, now, I already mentioned that the minimum possible SSE, I think there's a sum of the squares of the errors. That's what they say, right? That's what they say in the GeoGebra app. But really, most other people say the sum of the squares or the sum of the squares of the residuals, right? Because that, that's what they are. Uh, they, they're known as residuals. So... Um, the uh, red line has an SSE of 124, uh, obviously, obviously terrible, uh, but the ideal one is 1.04. It's like the best you can best you can get for the. And notice that you can, of course, the best possible SSE for any data would be zero, right? Wouldn't it be nice to have a to have all? What would that mean? That would mean all the points would be perfectly on the line, right? And uh, but that's when when you're talking about data that you're gathering from the real world, that's usually not possible. So here's here's my attempt. So the target SSE was 1.04688. What I ended up with was 1.04711, and then I gave up. I just thought, okay, that's enough. That's enough playing around. So um, the, see the problem with these programs is that okay, uh, this is allowing you to even to get a feel for what the sum of the squares of the residuals are and when you make that number as low as possible you get a really good line that really fits the data as you can see in this slide this one really fits the data it's really good the problem is you kind of know the answer in advance you know what the SSE is supposed to be in advance what if you don't know I mean, that's that's statistics. Statistics is what you don't know, right? You just have in front of you a bunch of data that you can plot on a graph. Well, what the heck do you do with that data? How do you know what's the best line for that from a bunch of points, 
that you gathered in your data. That's really what we're after here. So, you know, it isn't so much, you know, working with apps that have these tricky magical powers behind them that know the answer. We, we actually need you to do that in this course. So, you know, when you're in grade 10, um, you probably did some kind of science investigation where you gathered pairs of numbers, maybe time versus speed or something like that, or time versus distance. And your teacher was expecting you to come up with some kind of linear relationship between this time versus distance and, uh, or between time and distance, that is. The, in grade 10, you probably noticed that there, you know, your data was, you know, some of your points were a little off. Some of your points veered this way from the, from the regression, regression line and some veered another way from the regression line. But that wasn't your fault. That's just the way randomness goes. That's just the way data goes. And any physicist would tell you that you need a lot of repetitions to make sure that this works and repetitions under the same conditions of the same phenomenon. Well, the thing is, um, once you got those points plotted, what did you do? Well, you didn't use this fancy dancy linear regression stuff, did you? You, you plotted the points on graph paper and then you took a ruler, took a ruler and then drew the best line you could, right? That agreed with as many points as possible. Now, it was probably very helpful. Maybe your teacher knew something about statistics and understood that if, if you knew that point bar x bar y, the mean of x and the mean of y is indeed a point on the regression line, then that really made your, um, made your regression line a whole lot more accurate. But if you try it against what we learn, what we're going to learn in this course, it's still way off. <laughs> we still, that's still a great deal of error. And uh, we're going to learn in this course how to, how to do this in a way that is as clean as possible and as close in agreement with your data as possible. So uh, the thing is, I offer one way of doing it. The book offers another way. I'm going to show you mine first. And of course, what do you need for computing correlation for Pearson's R? Well, you need data naturally. So n equals 20 for a minimum scientific sample. But you know, when you're practicing these problems, you can use far fewer. You need the sum of the squares of the deviations on x, which was abbreviated SSX. And I got these here on the bottom of the column. You also have the sum of the squares of the deviations on y over here, and another one for the sum of the squares of the product of the deviations of x and y. How do we explain that? Well, we have the SSX is for computing variance, right? You know that you use this for computing variance, um, the sum of the squares, the sum of these squares here on this column. When you add them up and divide by n minus 1, you're going to get the variance. We learned that in Chapter 2. Well, what about this for y? You get SSY. Well, that's going to be the variance on y when you divide by n minus 1. Once again, these are just... Uh, these are just, uh, you know, standard things we learned in Chapter 2. This last one, though, is kind of weird. Here we're taking this column, xi minus bar x, not the one that's squared, but the one that's not squared, and yi minus bar y, that column. So you take this column here, multiply by this column here to get the numbers in this column, and you have to add them up and put your number here. When you divide that number by n minus 1, you get what is called the covariance. That is the variant variation between the variables. Whereas SSX and SSY alone give you the variation within the variables. So here's the variation between the variables. Okay, you need all that for Pearson's R. And it takes a bit of a table, and this is this table I like because it uses the computation of standard deviation that you learned in chapter two without any changes. 
The thing about chapter three is that they give you this in the book. If you look, if you use the formula that's in the book, it gives you this kind of moon man formula, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, but first of all, I'll talk more about my formulas. So SF, now, of course, for XI, we go down here and we take the sum, we divide by five and we get bar X. And over here, we can get bar Y. Here are the here are the formulas uh, for all these. The formulas are um, you know for the sample variance sample sample variance on x and y. The covariance, as you can see, is a sum of every entry in this column, and you put the number there. That's what that's what this represents. This capital letter sigma means a summation. You're adding up the numbers in the column. Okay, and so. In brief, Pearson's R, if we take this, uh, sorry, if we take this number divided by n minus 1 and the square root of this divided by the square root of n minus 1 and the square root of this divided by the square root of n minus 1, this simplifies to this expression here. The n minus 1s all cancel. And then you end up with this formula when you substitute. So it's kind of neat. Basically, you're taking this number here sorry, you're taking this number at the end here and you're dividing by the square root of that number times the square root of that number. Really, this is just three numbers taken from your table. Uh, I find it kind of easy to think about and the variance, well, you've done it in chapter two. It, they're familiar equations and I know that a lot of students feel comfortable doing it that way. Um, this is the way the book does it. Um, now, one thing I must say for the book is that, well, the table is certainly smaller. We only have five columns, whereas the table over here had seven columns. Um, but that's about the only thing. Uh, we Basically, the, um, the formula becomes a lot more complicated because you have all these sigmas. It's just crazy with sigmas. Sigma x times y minus sigma x sigma y. And of course, the, sigma, the sum, of, sum of x, y has to be multiplied by n. And then you have sum of x, sum of y, and then you have this, right? Essentially, it's the same thing. As this is based on the same idea. It's just that the sample variance is a different formula. The sample variance on y and the covariance, they're all different formulas. But why are they different? Uh, why are they different from these formulas? What's, what's the problem here? Well, there's actually no problem. It turns out that these, that these formulas are algebraically equal to these formulas. And it turns out that these formulas, you know, if, if, they were, if they were programmed into a computer, they would actually take up less memory and uh, would probably run, you know, slightly more efficiently. I uh, wouldn't say a whole lot more efficiently because really computers overall are faster anyway. So these, these uh, formulas and these formulas, like I said, are algebraically equivalent. I could give you a proof of this, but... To be honest with you, a proof is really beyond the scope of the course. Uh, I mean, I could do it because uh, I think on some level you do have to learn about this, this whatever the sigma stuff is, um, like what is meant by these sigmas. Well, what is, what is a sigma is that you're adding up a list of numbers. So something like sigma xy is really the sum of this column here, right? And... Um, Let's go to the next slide. So we have hours of TV. Uh, this is a worked example that I decided to do. Uh, and this is actually from uh, question number three on page 168. So prior to a physics exam, a group of friends decided to record a number of hours watching TV and their score on the upcoming exam. So here we have hours of TV. And notice it's just eight, seven, four, three, and 10. These are, of course, because this is time, this would, this would, if you were graphing this, go on the x-axis. But for this example, we're not really putting anything on a graph. We're just going to compute the correlation. Like how well does watching TV correlate with your marks on a physics exam? Okay, that's kind of the question we're being asked here. So uh, we're being asked to find and classify the correlation coefficient. So we're going to find R. We're going to classify it. Is it strong? Is it weak? Is it positive? Is it negative? Kind of thing. And uh, it's basically the same problem with the same numbers 
except we have one less data point. So don't get fooled if you look at my answer and it's different from the answer in the back of the text because it will be different from the back of the text because I'm not using the same, uh, I'm, I, I kind of altered the data a little bit by omitting one of the points. Um, so here's the table I'm going to be using. So then, okay, now let's go here. I filled out the table. So I have XI, uh, hold on. I have XI and I and notice that all these numbers here are filled in here. Now, if I add these numbers up and divide by five, I get 6.4. That's the mean of, of X. All these numbers here for the score on the exam, they got put here. I added them up, I divided by five, and that's what I got, 75.8. Then I did, okay, so this, basically eight minus the mean gave me this, seven minus the mean gave me this, four minus the mean gave me this. So I'm just subtracting, right? So this minus six, eight minus 6.4 is 1.6. Seven minus 6.4 is 0 0.6. Four minus 6.4 is negative 2.4, because four is less than 6.4, and so on. So we just went down there. For yi, our average is 75.8, and 72 minus 75.8 is 2.5, uh, sorry, is ne negative 3.8 and 67 minus 75.8 is negative 8.8 .8, and so on we go down there we take these numbers and square them to get this column we take these numbers and square them to get this column we add up the numbers in this column to get our ssx we add up the numbers in this column to get ssy then we multiply that all this column by all of this column to get this column that is to say 1.6 times negative 3.8 is negative 6.08. So we're taking this number, multiply by that number to get that number. And we do the same thing going all the way down the column and we get this column. We add those numbers up and we get the sum of the squares on x, y. When we, when we, see, what, when we see what's gone on, uh, again, this, uh, this stupid thing is hiding my, my work. Okay, so I compute my r and I get my negative 117.6 divided by 33.2 times 510.8 underneath square roots and I get negative 0.903. Now if you get a correlation less than negative 1, like negative 2, negative 3, something like that, you're doing something wrong. You cannot get a correlation less than negative 1. You cannot get a correlation greater than positive 1 that your full range of correlations is entirely between negative one and positive one. And so 0.903 is a really strong negative correlation. It says that according to our data, and you always have to say according to our data, that watching a lot of TV indicates uh, your mark will go down. The more hours spent watching TV, the lower your mark on a physics test. So there you go. That's a worked example. So let's go to the next one. Uh, getting back to the Aboriginal example, notice what we did here. You, on a spreadsheet, you can go straight to Pearson's R, doing year versus the wages for the Aboriginals, and I got 0.88. And the year versus non-Aboriginal gives you a Pearson's R of 0.98. So you got a moderately strong correlation, like a fairly strong correlation for ab Aboriginals, for wages over time, that's this blue line. But the uh, non-Aboriginal correlation of uh, wages versus time, uh, notice that the line is more consistent. Um, okay, now the formula re that required us, that notice we didn't need to use much of a table for this. And because it's a spreadsheet, we can go straight to the correlation using equal sign corral, blah, blah, blah. This is the cell range. So for the corral for the Aboriginal population, it's this and this. That's I'm calling this column A and I'm calling this column B. That's what these are. Now, if we were doing this for the non-Aboriginal population, I would use the same cell range for column A here and then use a, use a different cell range for column C. This would be C2 to C11. And of course, the result would be placed here. 
yeah, that is the slide presentation and hope you enjoyed it.